Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. I don't know how many of you guys remember that show, but it used to come on when I was a kid. And it came on, I think, at around 5 or 5.30 in the afternoon, and we used to watch it at home. But I did not enjoy it at all because they only spoke English, and I didn't really understand English when I was a kid. Anyway, I think about sands through the hourglass because today is my birthday, and this episode of Thoughts That Count is going to be a birthday special. I'm going to be sharing some reflections with you because around this time of the year, I take some time to reflect on my life and see how far I've come, where I am, and where I think I should be, and what's next. And so in thinking about that, I have some ideas that I'd like to share with you, and I really believe that they're going to inspire you. I really believe that you're going to find this useful and helpful to you. So stick around for the rest of this episode. All of these thoughts and so much more coming up today on Thoughts That Count. So today's my birthday. Yes, go ahead, right there in the comment section. Say something nice, something sweet. Don't just put HBD, say happy birthday, and then write something sweet, what I mean to you, what you would do for me, all that kind of nice stuff. Okay, cool. One of the things that I'm aware of on my birthday every single year is the fact that life doesn't stand still. It's a reminder that life does not stand still. Life is constantly moving. Time is constantly moving. I am constantly and consistently aging. And so this whole idea that it's possible to be stagnant in life, it's possible to be in the same place, is really false. It's not accurate because you can never be in the same place. You're either moving forwards or you are moving backwards. I'll give you an example. If you are 21 years old and broke, you understand that you are 21 years old and broke. And maybe you might say, you know what? It's not so bad because I'm still a kid and I'm still figuring things out. And if you are 41 years old and broke and you have been broke since you were 21, you understand that you haven't been, you, you, you're not in the same place that you were when you were 21. You are worse off, right? You are worse off because it is worse for you to be 41 and broke than it is to be 21 and broke. And so it's this idea that life never really stands still. Life is always moving, always evolving. You should be always moving and always evolving, always growing and progressing because if you are not moving forward, you are moving backwards. So with that understanding, what I want to do today is I want to share with you seven things that I have learned so far in my life that I believe to be truly valuable and you will find some great value in these things as well. I want to share seven different ideas with you and you might want to write these down. You, want, you might want to go ahead and like this video so that you can come back to it, save the video, share the video with a friend. But I do believe that there is great value in these ideas that I want to share with you. These are principles that I hold closely. These are lessons that I have learned. These are values that I hold so strongly in my life. And so far, I have found them to be greatly valuable. So number one, even if it's meant to be, you can still mess it up. Even if it is meant to be, you can still mess it up. We, we have popularized this idea that if it is meant to be, then it will be, right? Dismissing any kind of responsibility on our part. And so we say, we say to one another and we say to ourselves things like, if it's meant to be, then it'll be. If it's meant to work out, then it'll work out. Things can be meant to be and you can still mess it up. It can be meant to be and you can still not have it. Whether it be in the area of your career, your calling, whether it be in the area of relationships, you, you as a parent, you as a husband, a wife, it doesn't matter. If it is meant to be, you still have a part to play. Even though it is meant to be, you can still mess it up. Let me put it to you this way. If I leave here where I am right now, I, if I say I'm going to be traveling from Johannesburg to Cape Town and I put on the GPS... Cape Town from Johannesburg. And the GPS is going to guide me. It's going to tell me exactly how to get to Cape Town. If along the way I choose not to listen to the GPS and travel my own way, make up my own route, I will either be delayed or I will not make it to Cape Town. Why? Because I did not listen to the guiding system. That guiding system for me is God. And so God can intend for so many things in my life to be. 
And if I choose not to live according to the way he wants me to live, if I choose to go my own way, it is possible for those things which are meant to be to never, ever happen in my life. And so, number one, get rid of this idea that, that if it's meant to be, then it'll be. It's possible that if it's meant to be, you can still mess it up. So I'm urging you right now, don't mess it up. If it's meant to be, don't mess it up. Number two, take yourself seriously. You have to take yourself seriously. People will only take you as seriously as you take yourself seriously. I was taught this when I was 19 years old. There was a man who told me that you teach people how to treat you. You teach people how to treat you. And teaching people how to treat you is not just about you telling people, treat me this way. You've got to treat me like that. There are two parts to it. Number one, you teach people how to treat you by correcting the way that they treat you. Saying yes and saying no. Letting people know that you don't appreciate certain things. You teach people how to treat you. But secondly, and most importantly, you teach people how to treat you by how you treat yourself. If you treat yourself as someone who is serious, you will be taken seriously by the people around you. And so, yes, you teach people how to treat you. But that is not by you telling people how to treat you. That is by you showing people how to treat you. Let me tell you, let me tell you a quick story. When I was 22, when I was 22, I believe, I got my first job, my first full-time job. And this is the only full-time job that I've ever had in my life. I believe it lasted for about four years, four, four or three years, somewhere between there, or maybe three and a half. And when this job started, I still remember the way that it started. So I used to be an intern at this place. And at the time, I didn't like the way that the boss would treat me. I didn't like the way he treated me. I, I absolutely hated it. That's a very strong word. And so by the time that it was time for me to finish this internship and leave, I fell in love with the place, right? I fell in love with the place, but I had this conflict. And so I was like, I still want to work at this place. And I still remember at the time when I said I have an interest in working here, instead of just gently explaining that, you know what, this might be impossible at this time, or maybe we're not hiring or something, make up something. I still remember the words that I was given were, that I was, I was of no use to that place. And so I left, right? I left, did something else, started serving in town, started doing other things around and made myself valuable as an individual. And after a year, a year after that, the same place came to me and said, we'd like to have you on board. When they said we'd like you to have you on board, I was excited because I love this place. I love the people there. I love what they stood for. But, but I had a problem with how I was treated. And so I still remember I spoke to one of the, one of the other guys who were there. He was a senior. And I said to him, listen, I really want to be here, but I don't know if I want to be here under the same conditions. And he suggested to me, he said, Let, let's go. I will be there as a mediator, as a third party. And I want you to say exactly what you are thinking. I want you to tell this man exactly what's on your mind before you accept the offer to come and work here. And so I said, that's great. I still remember I went in there and I spoke my mind. I said, I don't like the way that you treated me. I don't like the way that you were towards me. And so I'd like to work here, but I want to know that I will be treated as a human being. I, I want to know that I'll be treated as someone who is respectable. And surely enough, that worked out. Now, fast forward a couple of years later, when it was time for me to leave this place, when I actually resigned from this place, it was because what I had said in the beginning didn't hold, right? What I had said in the beginning, when I said I want to be treated a certain way and I was not being treated that way, I had to take myself seriously. I made a promise to myself that I would not stay at a place where I was not respected. I would not stay at a place where I was not valued. And it seemed as though I was being controlled. It seemed as though I was being manipulated. And I said, okay, I'm out. I am leaving. And I cared about the place. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to go. I didn't have a plan. <laughs> Worse than that. I didn't have money in the bank. I did not have savings. I, did, I didn't know what I was going to do. I decided right there and then that I'll go back to my mother's house. And I went back to my mother's house, right? 
I cared so deeply about that place. I still remember at the time I actually had a girlfriend and this girl for the first time in which I kind of regret to this day, she got to see me cry, <laughs> got to see me cry. And I texted her, I said, hey, I did it. I resigned. And right after a couple of hours, she came to me and I just sat me and began to cry because I didn't want to leave this place. But I understood that if I'm going to be taken seriously, I have to take myself seriously. And I've lived my life this way ever since. So, number, number two, take yourself seriously. You teach people how to treat you by how you treat yourself. Take yourself as someone to be taken seriously. Keep your word. Do what you said you were going to do. Show up when you said you were going to show up. Show up for yourself. And if you treat yourself as someone to be taken seriously, you can expect other people to take you seriously. Number three, and I believe that this is where many people might disagree, but that's okay. The world does not owe you unconditional love. This is one of the lessons that I have learned, that the world does not owe you unconditional love. You have to contribute something. You have to give something to the world. You have to do something that is meaningful, something that is valuable. You have to provide something to the world that makes a difference and makes it a better place. Right? The people who are most beloved are the people who are starting companies and providing entertainment, making people laugh, making people happy. The people who are providing services that make people better, that are growing people, that are improving people's lives. The farmers who are providing food. These are the people who are beloved in the world. The world does not owe you unconditional love. And this idea that you should be loved just as you are is absolutely false. It is false. And the sooner you get rid of that idea, the sooner your life gets better. And the, the sooner you can start to progress and become an individual who is truly valuable and worthy of being loved by the world. God loves you as you are. But I want you to understand the world will not love you as you are. <laughs> the world is not going to appreciate you as you are. The world is not going to value you as you are. Human life in itself is truly valuable. But I want you to understand that if you are going to be valuable to society, you have to be a contributor. What are you contributing to society? What did you bring into this world? When all is said and done and you leave this place, what did you do? Right? I want you to understand that the world does not owe you unconditional love. Your boyfriend does not owe you unconditional love. Your girlfriend, your spouse does not owe you unconditional love. No one really loves anybody unconditionally. And you know that you don't love anybody unconditionally. You have a couple of conditions. And should they violate any of your standards, they are out. And in the same way, the world does not owe you unconditional love. So, number four. Don't make excuses for being late. Don't make excuses for being late. This has been a very interesting reflection on my part <laughs> because I, I, I realize that I'm closer to 30 now, right? I don't usually disclose my age to people, right? I'm closer to 30 now than I am to 20, right? And being closer to 30, I realize that I don't have time for games anymore. But at the same time, I start to ask myself some questions. Have I done the things that I said that I would do? Have I done the things that I wanted to do? Let me tell, let me tell you something. If you, can, if you can see in your life that you have fallen behind or you are falling behind, the worst thing that you can do for yourself is, is make excuses. Because every excuse that you will make sounds good to you. It's convenient. Let me tell you something. Worse off that you will find other people who agree with you on that excuse. And so the worst thing that you can do when you are late is come up with an excuse. What do I mean when I say that you are late? You know where you want to be right now. You know where you want to be. And one of the most frustrating things that I have with people who care about me, people who genuinely love me and have my best interest at heart, when I talk about this, they have the tendency of telling me that no, 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 no. You are still on time. You are still young and you are still this. And they, they like to refer to themselves and give their own examples. But let, let me say something. Don't allow other people to project their timelines on you. 
we understand this in reverse, right? We understand this on the opposite end where if somebody has life really take off for them at a very young age, at 22 years old, they are married and a millionaire and they are contributing greatly to society, we often tell ourselves that that's their timeline. But now on the opposite end of that, if somebody comes to me and tells me, no, you got to be patient. I got married when I was 45 years old. It's like, that's okay, but that's you. That's, is that the new standard now? Is that really the new standard? And I'm not saying that it's bad that you got married when you were 45. I'm saying that I've got my own timeline. I've got my own standard. I've got my own desire. And I've got to be able to be honest with myself when I feel like I am late. Every single one of us know when we are late. Every single one of us know when, when, when you've fallen behind your own schedule, right? And so I'm not saying that you have to be unreasonably hard on yourself, but you have to be hard on yourself within reason. You have to be hard on yourself and say you're falling behind. You're falling behind. Your mates are graduating or your mates are getting married and having children. Your mates have built up businesses. Your mates are able to take care of their families and you are still not able to do this. You have to be honest with yourself when you are running late. Don't let other people project their timelines on you. And just because it took them 50 years, they think that it has to take you 50 years as well. It might take you 50 years. I'm not saying that it won't. But I'm saying don't let, don't let it be because somebody else projected that timeline onto you. I am done letting people project their timelines onto me. I'm done. I've had to be very honest with myself in areas where I am late and say, you're late. You're late and you need, you need to hurry up. You're late and you don't have time to play right now. You need to focus. You are late. There was a time when I really got to think about this. It's a couple of years ago. I believe at the time I was, I might have been 24 years old, 24 or 25 years old. And my mother felt terribly ill and she needed to be admitted into ICU. At the time, she didn't have medical aid. We didn't have medical aid uh, for the family and there was no money in the house. And I still remember we took her, well, we called an ambulance and it took her to this private hospital. When she got there, they kept her in a waiting room. And from there, they said, you have to take her to a public hospital. Now, we, we all understood that public hospitals are a little less than convenient. I don't want to say, I don't want to say too many bad things about them. They are a little less than convenient. And when they said, you have to take her to a public hospital, I thought to myself, what if we pay for her medical care out of pocket? I said, we could make a plan. We could make some calls and ask some people. And I, I know that there are some people who would be generous and be able to help out if I tell them that we need to get my mother into ICU. And I still remember I asked the lady, I said, how much, how much will it cost roughly? She said, you're looking at roughly about 230,000. I said, ah, <laughs> I don't have 230,000. I don't have it. Now, by the grace of God, that story ends well because she ends up going to a public hospital and she's still alive today by the grace of God. But I say this to say at the time, it really hit me with a wake up call. It really hit me with a wake up call because I am a 24 or 25 year old young man who should be able to respond. And I'm not able to respond. And if you speak to anybody, they'll tell you, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. You are, you are right on time and you are right on schedule. I was able to make millions when I was 70 years old. And so it's okay for you also to ju just wait and give yourself time. Listen to me. I'm, I'm not saying that I am not grateful for the way that my life has unfolded so far, but I'm saying that I do realize that it would be better for me to move quicker than I have been. Right? It was an absolute scare to know that it, would, it, it could have been possible for my mother to pass away and many years later, me realizing that it was just because I didn't have 230000 for her medical care. Couldn't afford it. And so I realized that I need to be honest with myself when I'm being late. When I'm late, I have to be honest with myself. I can't make excuses because excuses are the worst thing that I can do for myself. And so I'm saying to you, be honest with yourself. Are there areas of your life where you realize that you are late? Perhaps along the way messed up some relationships and you know that it was your fault. You should have been married by now. 
or perhaps it's in the area of your career, you realize that at this point you should have been further than you are right now and you're only starting now with your business because these past years you've been messing around. Got to be honest with yourself when you are late because then you know that I've got to work harder than anyone else. I got to move the way no one else is moving right now. So number four, don't make excuses for being late. Number five, you must believe that you can. You must believe that you can. Listen, this is so simple and this is probably the most important thing that you will hear me say today. You must believe that you can. Whatever can means for you, you must believe that you can. Whatever it is that you want to do, whatever it is that you want to accomplish, you must believe that you can. I'm telling you, a person who does not believe that they can is in a terrible place to be. I still remember when I was in high school, I learned this in such, a, in such a powerful way because I had a friend of mine who was an athlete. I was an athlete as well. And when we would go compete at national championships in cross country, you would have hundreds of athletes competing at the same time. And I would say to him that I'm aiming, I am aiming for at least the top 100. If I can be in the top 100, I'll be happy. And I would hear him say that he was aiming <laughs> to be in the top three, top three. It was inconceivable to me that in such a race, I could aim for top three. It was inconceivable. But to him, it wasn't inconceivable because guess what? He would go on to do top three. He, he, he was used to this. This is what he does. He's, he was a top athlete. And so what often happens is that the, the, the polokos of the world who are aiming for top 100, when they hear you say that you are aiming for top three, they tell you to be realistic. You have to believe you can. The moment that you hear somebody tell you to be realistic, you have to ask yourself, whose reality are we talking about? Are we talking about your reality? And how's that going? How's that working out? What, who, whose reality are we talking about? You have to believe that you can. There is nothing that you can do unless you believe that you absolutely can, that you are absolutely capable. There is nothing in this world that you can do unless you fully believe that there is nothing that's stopping you from being among the greats. I truly believe I can. You know, I meet a lot of people who went to primary school with me and high school with me, and they are truly fascinated by what I do. Some of them see me, some of them see me at events. Some of them see me on stage and they are truly fascinated. The reason why it's so fascinating to people who knew me many years ago was because I'm, I'm a completely different person. I was a shy, timid kid. Man, I was scared. I would cry easily. I couldn't speak up for myself. But for me to become a speaker, most people often ask this question, but for me to become a speaker, it started with me believing that I can be a speaker. It didn't start with the training. The training is great, but the training means nothing to a person who doesn't believe they can. I want you to understand this, right? The training means absolutely nothing to the person who believes that they cannot do it. So you have to believe that you can. Do you believe that you can? More Thoughts That Count with Poloko right after this. This episode of Thoughts That Count is made possible by Pebete Luxury Homes. Listen, if you are looking for a place to stay in Gauteng, just a young getaway, I 100% recommend Pebete Luxury Homes. It is home away from home. And I say this because I have stayed with them several times in a few of their different homes and you always feel at home. They go overboard for great hospitality. So if you are traveling to Gauteng, if you are in Gauteng and you just want a young getaway, just a little break where you can have privacy, where you can have luxury, where you can have great hospitality, 100% recommend them as a luxury home. There are links in the description of this video where you can see some of their stunning homes and contact them as a luxury homes for your booking today. When you change your thoughts, you change your life. This is Thoughts That Count with Poloko. Number six, perspective is everything. One of my most popular videos online was from an interview that I had with Tibo Tash a couple of years ago. And the part that really got popular was the part where he was asking me about my background and the disadvantage that I came up with. He was asking me, how do I feel about the fact that there are certain people who I know I could be doing so much better than who are in the field that I am in, but simply because they have other privileges, 
they are not doing better than me. And my response to him was that it's a blessing. Because I truly do believe that what many people consider to be a disadvantage in my background, what many people don't see as privilege, I, I see it as a blessing. Not because I think I'm better than people just because I came up with nothing. I don't think I'm better than people just because I don't have rich parents. But I'm saying that I see myself just as blessed as the kid who grew up with rich, with, with rich parents. Right? And on the idea of privilege, as a matter of fact, I have to change my understanding of privilege. Because many people, many people actually, when they see me now, they think that I came up in privilege, right? But privilege to them means rich parents, you know, grew, grew up in the suburb, private schools and all of that. But that wasn't really the case. But I still consider myself to be a child from privilege. As a matter of fact, I still consider myself to be living in privilege. And the way that I, that I define privilege for myself is the fact that, first of all, I have God on my side. I have the privilege of having a relationship with God, a good relationship with God, an understanding of my need for God. I consider myself to be a privileged individual because I've literally never had to spend the night in hospital. I've never spent the night in hospital. I've never been that sick. I've never been that injured. So I've never had to spend the night in hospital. I consider myself privileged. I have a healthy body. I have a strong, healthy body. I consider that a privilege. I have a fully functional, able, but I can't, there is nothing that I cannot do. That to me is a privilege. And so I've had to redefine privilege for myself because I don't only now, now I don't only consider privilege to be coming from a rich family, a rich bloodline. I consider myself privileged because I have all these things. I have a family. I have friends. I, I am blessed. I am an intelligent young man. One of the brightest minds that you will ever meet. How is that not a privilege? And I look good too. So perspective is everything. You have to see your life differently. You have to see yourself differently. You have to see your circumstances differently. Let me tell you something about life. Something very interesting that I've observed is that good things and bad things happen to everyone. Both good things and bad things, not just bad things. Good things and bad things happen to everyone. And for someone with a terrible perspective on life, they, they cannot even see the good things happening in their lives. And as for the bad things that happen to everybody, it so happens that there are people who become better because of the bad things that happen and there are people who get worse off. How is that? How can that be the case? How, how can it be that you have two people who grow up in the same area, under the same circumstances, sometimes even in the same household, turn out differently? And to both of them, you can say that it was because of their upbringing. One is an alcoholic because dad was an alcoholic, and one is not an alcoholic and doesn't touch alcohol because dad was an alcoholic. Right? One cannot manage relationships with women because dad couldn't manage relationships with women. And one manages his relationship with his wife well. He's a father and a husband and a faithful one at that because he got to see what a broken home looks like. Same scenarios, different outcomes because it's different perspectives. Life is all about perspective. Perspective is everything else. You have to change how you see your life. You have to decide how you want to see your life. So, number seven, God is everything. God is everything. Without God, I have nothing. And without God, I am nothing. At every single turn in my life, I have had people come into my life and leave my life. I have had people come into my life and look out for me. And I never gave all the credit to those individuals. Credit belongs to God. It is God who provides. It is God who takes care of me. Even as I talk to you right now, my heart beats without my consent. Even as I speak to you right now, I breathe involuntarily so. It is God who keeps me alive at every waking moment, even when I sleep. It is God who is the source of all things. All of my provision comes from Him. 
You could take away a deal. You could take away a contract. You could take away a job and God will still take care of me. He takes care of the birds and I'm far more valuable than the birds are. He will take care of me at every single turn, in every, in every season of my life. I got to a point in my life where I decided that worry was a waste of time. I don't worry anymore. I don't worry about anything. I just let life be. I truly do believe that God is on my side. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter. I truly, truly believe that God it's for me. And so to me, God is everything. This is the seventh, but certainly not the least, the most important by far lesson that I have learned. Without God, I have nothing. And without God, I am nothing. So these are just seven lessons that I have learned, seven values, you might want to call them. But whatever you want to call it, whatever it means to you, I hope that it's, it helps you. I hope that you find some kind of value in it. But my life is certainly better for it. And so, my friend, thank you so much for tuning in. These are Thoughts That Count with Poloko. This was Thoughts That Count with Poloko. We hope you've been inspired, encouraged, and challenged to make every thought count. See you on the next episode.